thank everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. I really appreciate your time. Um, it means so much. I, uh, I'm really excited right now because I love the Arboretum. I've learned so much at the Arboretum over the last many years. Uh, so many good people that do events and speak at the Arboretum. So I just, I feel like this is a really amazing opportunity for me and I just can't thank everybody enough for joining and also for the Arboretum, everything that they do. I just, you know, you just wouldn't be the same city without them, quite honestly. Um, and in terms of our, we've got a couple of just nuts and bolts here. There is a um, little chat icon at the bottom of your screen. And if you have questions during the presentation, put it in the chat. And what I'm gonna to try to do is stop maybe five or six times and answer some questions from the side. I do want this to be fairly interactive. Uh, Zoom format is just different than things used to be. So I'm not gonna try to do exactly what I would have done in person seven months ago. I'm modifying a little bit for Zoom. Um, the first part of this presentation is gonna be mostly me talking and showing some slides. It's about 20 minutes. But then in the second part where I get into the nuts and bolts on things you can do to help, I'm gonna show a lot of videos to sort of just spice it up a little bit. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. I think the important thing to know about me, uh, my ultimate purpose in life is I really care a lot about trees because I love our planet. Um, my, my mission is to preserve, plant, and promote trees. Um, and promoting is just education, spreading the word. I really do think that trees are an essential part of the health of our planet. It, they're just so critical to so many of our ecosystems. And I think that we have some very obvious solutions staring us in the face in terms of how to deal with major pressing environmental issues. Number one is trees. Um, so I feel very passionately about this topic. And this is what I'm gonna be covering tonight. I'm gonna to start off with a little bit of negative news on the state of things. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how trees can solve some of those negative issues. And then we're gonna get into some fun nuts and bolts stuff you can actually go out and use. Um, and hopefully this is fun and engaging. And in, this, in the side note over here on the chat side, I gave you my email because I really would love to hear your feedback. This is um, the first time I've done this presentation in this format. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on how it went. All righty, let's get started. So I think where we begin is there's a lot of change happening on planet Earth. Um, it doesn't really matter what, uh, whether it's gonna be good or bad in the long run, but we just know a lot's changing right now. And I think some of the things that I would label as maybe the top six biggest concerns to me personally, uh, and I'm gonna touch on these in a little bit more detail. It's loss of trees. It's a decrease in biodiversity. It's the rise of air pollution, um, loss of our topsoil, disappearing drinking water, and then an increase in oxidized carbon. Uh, I want to go through these in a little bit more detail. I'll just kind of give you some high-level facts on what's going on in each of those six major categories. So with trees, there's a really interesting um, piece of information from Greenpeace, and it's basically that if we scale Earth to 46 years, so let's just assume for a second that Earth is 46 years old, humans have only been here for four hours. The Industrial Revolution began one minute ago, and in that time, we've destroyed half of the world's forests. Second fact that's kind of scary. Um, if you count to 2,000, so one 1,000, two 1,000, that's two seconds. In those two seconds, we lost a football field worth of trees. If you do it again, one 1,000, two 1,000, we just lost another football field worth of trees. It happens every two seconds here on planet Earth, we lose a football field every two seconds. Then we talk about biodiversity. So World Wildlife Foundation has been doing a lot of research on this and uh, we've lost over half of all species of birds, fish, animals, you name it. And that's just in the last 40 years. Talk about air pollution. Right now, you know, here in our area, North Carolina, things aren't too bad. We've got pretty good air quality, quite honestly. But in much of the world, that's not the case. Uh, world Health Organization estimates about 4 million deaths per year due to air pollution. I have sort of an interesting story about this, just personally speaking. I was in China not too long ago and I was just so surprised at the lack of blue sky. And I talked to my brother who lived there and he said they were lucky to see a blue sky twice a year. Um, had to wear masks everywhere. You wanna run, you wanna jog, you wanna walk, you've gotta wear like the, the particulate masks, not just the, you know, 
This is not to stop spit. This is actually to filter out um, pollutants. It's so bad that in Shanghai, where they have the Bund, which is the major tourist attraction, they actually have to, they put up this giant picture of the Bund on a blue day, blue sky day, so that you can take a photo and it looks like you're there with blue skies, but there's rarely blue skies there. And it's because of the, 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 the pollution. Um, talking a little about topsoil, in the last 150 years, we've lost half of the world's topsoil. That's, that's dangerous, you know, this is what we grow our food in. We need topsoil. Water, we are, NASA's been monitoring 21, excuse me, 37 of our major aquifers here on planet Earth. And what, we're, what NASA's finding is that 21 of those aquifers are running out of water too fast to be replenished. And when we talk about water, it's a whole different discussion than oil. You know, we have a lot of global war over oil. Now imagine water becomes in short supply. That's a very, very scary scenario for humans. And then finally is oxidized carbon. So carbon can only go two places. It either goes up or it goes down. If it goes up, we call it oxidized carbon. If it goes down, we call it sequestered carbon. And, you know, although vehicles take a bad rap for oxidizing carbon, uh, it's really not even vehicles that are the major problem. The major problems are deforestation, um, huge fires raging out of control. You all saw the fires in the Amazon, Australia over the last two years. And um, agriculture is a major issue as well, the way we do industrial agriculture. Uh, and then also cement production. I don't know if you know this, but cement production is a huge source of issues. So. Uh, or carbon goes down in the soil and it's held stable by plants, trees, things like that. And uh, again, NASA has been watching this very closely. Since the industrial revolution began 200 years ago, we've had a 40% increase in carbon in the atmosphere. And what that's doing for better or worse is it's rapidly changing climate, weather patterns, all these things. And you know, who knows if it'll be good or bad, but it's always scary when things change this fast. So that's my super depressing spiel about where we stand on some of the really big issues. Um, I do have good news though. I think that we have some great solutions and namely trees. So if you think about trees, this is one of the original tools that nature used to help create the planet we know and love today. Trees have been around for a very, very long time, and they, they are a cornerstone part of our ecosystems, uh, corner of just a major fundamental part of why Earth is what Earth is. So the argument that I would make, and that I'm gonna make, is that with enough trees, we can start to turn these major issues and fix them. And this is nothing high tech. We don't have to build the giant turbines now that are filtering air. There's some really harebrained ideas out there that are costing billions of dollars to make. But we have this free technology from planet Earth and it's called a tree. So let me walk you through each of those pieces of bad news that I gave you. And by the way, you know, I actually have a slideshow. My... Jeez Louise, sorry y'all. <laughs> Let's look at some slides. All right, well, we are here in the slideshow. And again, bear with me. Uh, we're gonna get to the fun videos and stuff soon. Um, but first we have some slides. Uh, how do I share my screen? Um, okay, let's see here. Well, y'all, like I said, this is sort of my first time doing this lecture digitally and I just forgot to share my screen. There you go, Basil, looks good. Hey, wow. <laughs> Apologies. All right. Um, so yes, this amazing piece of technology, it's called a tree. Trees are just fascinating. Uh, let's go through some of the same issues again. Let's talk about where trees can make a big difference. So if we talk about biodiversity, um, if you all have read Doug Tallamy, you know he talks about what an oak tree can do. So I, I just love how he describes the power of an oak tree. Uh, it's, host to, it's host to about four or 500 different species of caterpillar. Um, it supports over a hundred vertebrates here in North America as a food source. So we're talking squirrels, chipmunks, deer, raccoons, you name it, a hundred different animals uh, live and survive based on those oak trees. It provides homes. Uh, and then you get down to a, a microbial level in the root system, in the canopy. I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of species. It is just a hustle and bustle of life. I like to call an oak tree. It's a grocery store and a neighborhood all in one. Um, and then you talk about like a forest or a jungle, it, it's a whole city. And these cities are home to 80% of all terrestrial life on planet Earth. 
This is where they live. So if we can get trees and forests restored, now we start bringing back biodiversity. We talked about air pollution and what the issues are there. Well, turns out trees are giant air filters. University of Washington did a study a couple of years ago uh, across 55 cities, they measured how much particulate the trees were able to remove. And I'm not gonna give it to you in metric tons, I'm gonna give it to you in blue whales. Uh, that's about, uh, those, 50, those trees across 55 cities removed the equivalent of 4,000 blue whales worth of pollution. We're talking about a lot of pollution getting pulled out of the air from trees. Um, we also talked about topsoil. So trees play a fundamental role in holding soil together, uh, reducing erosion, and pulling water down. When it rains, an oak tree will pull thousands of gallons of water down to the ground. The little droplets follow all the complex root systems. You need trees to reduce runoff. I'll give you a really good example. If you have an acre of hardscape, meaning like an, uh, um, how about a parking lot? And it rains an inch of rain, 25,000 gallons of water will come off of that parking lot. If you have that same acre and it's trees and green space instead, it only releases 750 gallons. We're talking about a 24,000 gallon difference on one acre of hardscape versus trees or you know, fields, whatever. That's really significant. When you start thinking about, you know, here in Raleigh, we're dealing with a lot of flooding issues right now. And everybody's, you know, pointing fingers, but what it really is is this. We don't have regulation strong enough to support the rate of growth we're experiencing. And what's happening is we're getting flooding because all of our trees are being cut down. We're losing the ecosystems that hold water in place. So you want to reduce the loss of topsoil. One big way to do it is get trees back in play. We talked about drinking water. I don't know if you know this, but in North America, 60% of all of our drinking water is due to forests. They play a major role in pulling the water down filtering water and getting it down into aquifers. So if we want to slow down water, get it down in the ground and have more drinking water for the future, we can look to trees to help with this too. And then finally, we talked about oxidized carbon. Um, there was a really awesome study last year, maybe two years ago now from Crowther Lab out of Zurich. And they identified 2.2 um, billion acres around planet Earth that are not being used. It's non-arable, meaning you can't really do anything with it. And this land is unforested. And they figured that if we can reforest those areas not being used, then we can capture two-thirds of all of the carbon that has been released in the last 200 years. And that's really, really significant. Again, we're talking about this free piece of technology that's a cornerstone for why Earth is what it is. You know, it's not rocket science here. And these trees will pull down two thirds of the carbon that we've released in the last 200 years. So I'm gonna pause there because next we're gonna talk about like basically what can you do to help. But that is in a nutshell sort of the the negative news and then the positive news. And I wanna pop over here to the, um, let's see here, where is that chat feature? Um, ba -dee -ba -dee. Chat, okay. If you have any questions, then let's go ahead and answer a few questions. All right. Um, and if you haven't put any questions in the chat and you want to, go for it, or if you wanna just hop in and ask a question, I, I'm totally on board with that too. I don't see any questions in the chat yet, Basil, but there's always a possibility they sent you one privately. Yeah, I don't have any questions so far, so I'll just keep going unless, I, uh, unless somebody wants to jump in, in which case you're welcome to do so. Great, all right, so what can you do to help? Um, I think this comes down to the following. Well, I'm doing a terrible job managing this presentation, by the way. So I, when we get to the videos, it will be, <laughs> I'll do a better job. Anyway, we're on this slide now. Um, what can we do? Well, we've got to plant new trees and we've got to care for the ones we've got. And it doesn't have to be a, a massive global mandate. We can all just start right where we live and encourage other people to do so. And that's exactly where I want to go next with this. So I'm gonna give you what I believe are the 12 best things you can do when it comes to planting trees, 
and caring for trees. And I am going to, uh, every you know, four or so um, ideas, I'm gonna actually bring it back to the big picture. So this is sort of a nuts and bolts section. Um, I hope it's not too nuts and bolts for a lecture, but send me that email later and let me know what you think about this presentation. I'd love to hear from you. All right, so things you can do when it comes to planting trees or it comes to caring for trees. Number one, when you plant a tree, you wanna make sure that you plant it in the right space. I wanna show you a picture from downtown Raleigh, oops. So this is more square. Uh, this is a beautiful old willow oak and uh, check out this soil volume here. Not exactly ideal for the oak tree. And then it's been sheared off the building here, all sorts of stuff going on. Definitely not the right place for this tree. I think if we just, you know, we're gonna plant trees, which we need to, but let's, in urban spaces, let's make sure we get the right tree for the right spot. I think it's very important. Number two, when you plant a tree, don't bury the root collar. I wanna show you two videos about this that are gonna help illustrate this point. So I've got a short clip here, and I got another clip I'm gonna show you. And let me just say in advance, uh, you're about to see the last two and a half years of all of my hairstyles and varying uh, quality of videos. So uh, get ready for the spot. The second mistake I see is burying the root collar. Let me tell you what a root collar is. It's a really important term. The root collar is the base of the trunk before it disappears to roots. So it is literally a flare. Some people call it the root flare, root collar, same thing. You can't bury that. There's two typical ways people bury that root collar. Either they plant too deep, so you need to make sure that that, that flare is at grade or just above grade, uh, or some people will actually pile mulch on the base of the trunk. Don't do that. Both of those. All right, before I go to this next video, were y'all able to see that or was it too laggy? It was fine. It was fine. It was fine. All good, Basil. All right, good. If that changes, somebody let me know. All right, uh, second video on this topic. You've probably seen this in the suburban landscape. This is what we call a mulch volcano. It looks great, but it's actually very harmful to the tree. Different parts of the tree are designed to perform different functions. The roots, for example, they are underground, they stay moist, they absorb water. The trunk is designed to grow above ground where it's supposed to stay dry. But having this mulch piled around the base of the tree constantly means that the cells of the trunk stay oversaturated. This causes damage to the cells, which means they're not able to perform their duties, which means the overall health of the tree begins to decline. In addition, the mulch volcano provides an excellent place for new roots to grow, and they begin growing round and round the trunk of the tree. Over time, this leads to girdling. Girdling roots will quite literally strangle a tree. This may sound bad, but the story actually gets worse to the flu and to other sicknesses. But the good news is this is a problem that we can fix. Okay, I'm not gonna go into the next part. Actually, yeah, let me just skip to the end here. Hold on one second. I do wanna show you um, the final result here. So let's see. <laughs> Well, the mulch volcano is gone and the trunk is clear of dirt and debris. There's no longer any opportunity for the roots to grow around the trunk. And we've got exactly what we want, which is we have a nice, well-developed root flare at the base of the trunk. The root flare is where the trunk spreads out before becoming roots that disappear underground. That so, you know, if we're gonna plant trees, we just need to make sure we do it right. We want our trees to grow and thrive. Um, so we don't wanna bury these tree trunks. Number three, when you plant, make sure you dig a hole that's two to three times the width of the root ball. So this is kind of how this should look. And the reason you wanna do this is because when that tree is trying to grow, it's gonna push out little roots and those roots need to be able to find lots of pore space. They can't push against clay. So this will help your tree establish more quickly and uh, ultimately just become a more healthy tree. All righty. Um, so, kind of already said this, but this is the sort of picture here. If we're gonna get all these trees in the ground, 
And experts estimate that we need something like 40 billion trees planted, which is a lot, but I think it's doable, quite honestly. But if we're going to plant 40 billion trees, then we've got to make sure that we're thoughtful about what we plant, where we plant it, how we plant it, so that this tree can go on and thrive. I'm going to pause there for more questions. Uh, let's see if we've got any questions here. We did get some questions, Basil. In fact, some of them happened right after we closed for the last breaks. So how about if we go to them real fast? Okay. I'm having uh, a navigation issue here. Where is the... Um... So right... Mm, okay. All right. You want to, how about you ask me the question and I'll answer it. I'll be happy to do that. Mary Ann asked, um, uh, do gardens and shrubs help as well as trees? Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, trees are my thing for sure, but, but anything that's sequestering carbon, providing, you know, habitat, uh, I would argue native varieties would be better than just any species. Native meaning something that would normally grow in your area, but absolutely. And Sarah wondered if there's a minimum size tree that has to be um, in order to make a difference. No. And you know, the research actually shows it's better to plant a smaller tree. Uh, they tend to establish faster than their larger counterparts. Uh, there are some challenges with getting them to, to you know, protect it from dogs and children and stuff, but ultimately the little trees actually end up doing the best usually, and native, I'll keep saying that. And Joyce commented that 2.5 million acres have been devastated in California by the recent wildfires, and what do you think is the future of this? Well, that's a big question. Um, California's got some tough issues to think about. You know, I don't... I don't Patagonia has done a lot of awesome work in this space. Uh, there's a video that Patagonia made called Damn Nation, and it's about the effects of dams. Uh, and I think California in particular has been hard hit by the damming of the Colorado River and some of these other rivers that run through there. I think that trees also have a role to play in this. Um, I think they've got to, California's got to be thinking about reforestation and not just for the, the purpose of harvesting later. Um, I think there are multiple really big issues, but I will just say this, you can never go wrong with planting trees. They bring about so much. They're such a cornerstone to the ecosystem. Everything follows behind them. The smaller life, the biodiversity, everything follows behind them. And Penelope commented that Raleigh is making smaller lots and bigger houses, which means less room for trees. What can we do about this? I think everything has to start at the bottom and at the top simultaneously. I noticed somebody's on here from Trees Durham and, and I love what they're doing. Kitty Rose is a really amazing advocate for getting um, change at the top. Uh, and I love, I love that. Uh, I think Leaf and Lim, we're, we're a little more focused on the grassroots side, which is from the bottom. So it comes from multiple directions. Um, I would love to see the code and the regulations in Raleigh significantly strengthened. I think uh, cities like Portland and Seattle are way ahead of us. And then if we start looking at Scandinavia and the Netherlands, I mean, they're light years ahead of us. So I think some new regulations are probably in order. And Joyce um, jumped forward a little bit and went to your planting of the tree and was wondering what soil you use to fill in the root hole that you've dug. Okay, so... That's a little bit of a tough question because it kind of depends on where you're digging. But I would generally recommend that if you want to amend soil, um, don't use fertilizers, don't use potting soil, just keep it really basic. A leaf compost is probably your best bet because it's leaves, which is what we see in the forest. If you walk in the forest, and we're gonna get into this later, you see leaves everywhere. So I would say leaf compost is probably the best amendment you can make. And you could go up to a solid quarter of soil volume could be leaf amendment if you wanted to. I think if you wanted to get a little more fancy, you know, you can make your own biochar with a cone pit that you can dig in the ground. Biochar is amazing stuff. A lot of cool videos on YouTube about how to do it. So I would maybe add some biochar, but that's a bit advanced. And if you happen to make your own compost or compost teas, add that as well. And James, wondered if you knew what the amount of deforestation is in North Carolina. I don't, but I know one thing. Um, as I dig more into this, I'm surprised at how little forest we have in North Carolina. Like, you know, when we drive around, it seems like we're a pretty green state, but there's two things that are kind of hard to perceive. Number one, a lot of these perceptions are just thin strips of woods, which don't have high ecological function. 
Second, a lot of invasive species, and invasive species are good for carbon sequestration, but what they're really lacking is being able to support migratory birds and wildlife and things like that. So I think um, the numbers are probably worse than I would like, and I don't have them, unfortunately. And Caroline wondered about the unused non-arable lands. She wondered if they are contiguous or if they're separated into lots of smaller plots. And is that okay? Yeah, most of them were pretty rural. Um, I, I think ultimately to drive major change, we probably, like most trees will be in more rural areas, but, but here's why I love these efforts in urban areas is because that's where the people live. And even if let's say urban areas, planting trees in urban areas aren't the heavyweight in the room we need to turn these issues around, they are the heavyweight in the room for changing public perception. And I think if we could ever really truly change public perception in urban spaces, we'd see a huge effort to reforest these more remote areas. And Marilyn, going back to your big tree versus small tree, she wondered if you were mentioning or talking about like a one gallon or seven gallon versus like ball and burlap big and small or a big species like oak compared to a small species like redbud. No, like a, uh, I was saying like a five to seven gallon versus say a 15, 20 gallon or a bald and burlap. I think bald and burlap are the most challenging of all. They've had bunches of their roots sheared off to be moved. Uh, they take a very long time to recover. A lot of good research showing how these smaller, meaning five to seven gallon, will outpace any of the larger plants over a 10 year time frame, and they're healthier. Oh, I was going to say, I think I had no more questions, but I think there's one more. Um, Pam said, one of the things we can all do is vote, vote for something. And it just keeps on moving. And I lost track. Well, you can definitely I'm not allowed to say anything to encourage people to vote. So I'll have to let you read that one on your own. That's a state law, by the way. And um, uh, Rod commented, mental health for humans is another important reason for trees in populated areas, is it not? Absolutely. Uh, there's a really cool uh, uh, set of um, studies um, on a site called Green Cities. It's University of Washington, I think. And I, I, I'm sorry, I'm blanking here on, but look up Green Cities. I think it's University of Washington and uh, they've compiled 4,500 different studies, peer reviewed research showing all the various benefits of trees. And it's insane. There, there's, there's crazy stuff. Like uh, if you live in a forested neighborhood while pregnant, um, your, your child's gonna likely have a heavier birth weight on average, which means you're having a healthier baby. And there's just endless uh, studies like this one. And I'm, I'm gonna make a little comment on this one and it might even apply for you for being an arborist. But whenever we have professional credit, like for landscape architects, landscape uh, contractors, one of the questions that it, it's on the form that we have to submit is how will this program um, help the uh, practitioner with uh, human health and well-being? How, how will the topic tie into that? So that's something that a lot of these groups are thinking about as well. Ah, interesting. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot there. There's a whole section on the site just about those studies. Well, very and good. Marilyn asked, uh, so does everyone just need to plant oaks or can we plant smaller species of trees? Absolutely. Uh, Doug Tallamy uh, in his book, um, his garden design book has this really cool um, set of recommended species for the Southeast. And I carry it around just because it's my little reference, but, um, and he's listed out all kinds of trees that are native to the Southeast and all sizes and fashion and you know whatever and there's a bunch of great native species to choose from and that was the questions in the chat basil perfect all right let's keep going here um so number four i'm a big fan of arborist wood chips um the arborist wood chips are a little different than your traditional mulches the reason i think we should use arborist wood chips to uh, put around our trees these do a really good job breaking down rotting um, feeding that soil, which we're going to get to soil here in just a minute. Uh, this is much better than any mulch you would buy. And the really great thing about it is you can get it for free. Any tree service will give this to you for free. And it looks quite nice. Here's a, here's a big tree with a nice big bed of wood chips. Um, I don't want to get into too much more detail. There's a lot of other reasons why these are better than mulch, but I'm a big fan and you're reusing a product. Always a win. 
Uh, let me just warn you about one thing here. Let me play a video for you. This has to do with mulch. But two to four inches, safe number if you're not sure what to do. One big thing you've got to watch out for, especially with a triple shred product, is it becomes hydrophobic over time. And this means that on the top of the mulch, it begins repelling water. If this happens, you're not getting water in your root system. The tree has to have water. And now, mulch actually becomes an enemy of your tree. It's causing a net negative impact to your tree. So, what you've got to watch for if, you're, if you see water running off the top of the mulch when you're watering, or if you notice that the top of the triple shred is looking rusty, go check. Turn it over, poke your finger through. Is it soft and loamy? Can you turn the mulch over? Or it has a hard crust developed on the top? If you've got a hard crust on the top, you've got to turn that mulch over. Um, the easiest way to do this is with a tool called the potato hoe. It has prongs that point down. Very easy way just to dig, pull, dig, pull. Very easy way to turn the mulch over. So mulch is a really good thing for the tree. I'd argue wood chips specifically, which look like this, are the best because they don't become waterproof. But if you do want a decorative mulch, like a triple shred or a, you know whatever, just watch out for this phenomenon right here. This is very common and this will actually end up hurting your tree pretty badly. All right, number five, uh, watering. So when we're planting trees, we've got to give them adequate water. Um, and this is tough because the symptoms of too much water are the same as the symptoms of too little water. They're hard to tell apart. I'll show you a trick I use on how I determine whether or not my plant needs water. So first trick, go and dig up a little bit of soil from underneath the canopy of your tree. If it's very dry and blows away in the wind, your tree needs some water. If it's very wet and goopy and muddy, it's oversaturated. Don't add any more water. What you're looking for is you're looking for soil that has some moisture and holds its form, but it's not dry enough to blow away and it's not wet enough to be muddy in your fingers. So we have a lot of master gardeners on this call. Y'all obviously can just look at a plant and see whether it needs water. Uh, for people who are starting off, I find this trick to be very helpful. It just really has to do with soil. Speaking of soil, one of my favorite topics here, I think that this is a contender for maybe the most important point here. Um, let me move this Zoom screen. I don't know if that's in your way or not. Um, so soil is the foundation for healthy trees and shrubs. It's, it's one of those things that's not obvious at first. And then once you start to understand how ecosystems work, it's like the most obvious thing in the world. But I, mean, I can say from personal experience, it wasn't obvious to me six years ago like it is now. Um, all right, let me show you a video on this topic. And y'all, I'm having problems with Zoom here. OK, here we go. All right, this is all about soil. Here in the forest, the soil has everything it needs. And because of that, it can take care of the trees. It feeds this oak here, and this thing is super happy. Here's the kicker. Each year, this oak drops these leaves. This rotting stuff, this is soil food. And if we have this, we also have air and we have water. This is what keeps soil alive. I'm Basil, and today I'm here to talk about soil. It is alive, and I mean, it's like really alive. It's like you and me. It needs oxygen, it needs water, it needs food. If it has these things, it's gonna feed your trees, it's gonna take care of your trees, they're gonna be healthy, they're gonna be happy. If it doesn't have these things, then you get this. This is what used to be a really beautiful old oak tree and it is suffering right now. It's a sick tree. And let me show you why. Check this out. So I'm gonna use this screwdriver and I'm gonna try to push it into the ground. I want you to see how much I struggle to get this thing in. We're talking, oh my goodness, maybe two inches, if I'm lucky. That's definitely not full of air. You can just see this stuff. There's no water. And let me see if there's anything in here that looks like rotting food for soil. No, it's just more of the same. It's dry, it's super hard. There's no rotting stuff in here. This is 
sick dirt, which means we have a sick tree. Here's the exciting news. We can resurrect this dead dirt and turn it back into healthy soil by replicating what we see in the forest every day. So here I recommend that we put down lots and lots of wood chips and then we let the leaves fall and rot every single year. That's going to create this amazingness that's full of air and water and giving the soil that rotting stuff it needs to eat. That means we've got healthy, happy soil that can then feed the trees. Now we have healthy, happy trees. It's a win-win. And the best part is this. If we do this on a large scale, then we can restore the health of this planet that we call home. So I'm such a huge advocate for soil, and I think you can overcomplicate soil and it scares people, but it really is a very, very, very simple thing. You just gotta feed soil. And what does soil like to eat? It eats rotting stuff, rotting leaves, rotting whatever. It just likes rotting stuff. And once you're feeding the soil, it quite literally is alive. You know, a teaspoon of healthy soil has enough fungal hypha to, to go around the world. It's an incredible amount of life in healthy soil. The problem is when we start doing things like fertilizers and herbicides and lots and lots of other chemicals that are used in the landscape, then we start killing the life in the soil. So we've got to avoid what I would call traditional fertilizers. These are things that have an NPK label, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. I'll show you a quick video and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Traditional fertilizers generate all sorts of problems. They can undermine the stability of your tree. They destroy the relationship between a tree and its beneficial mycorrhizal fungi. They pollute our streams, killing fish and other wildlife. There are some good fertilizer products available, uh, but they are the ones that are focusing on enhancing biology, not on chemical inputs. So you want to look for products that have little to no nitrogen, no phosphorus, beneficial microbes, so those are fungi, bacteria, and then organic matter. Typically, the organic matter is going to be kelp, manure, yucca plant, these sorts of things. Once again, the key is to focus on the biology, the living component within the soil. If that's right, if that's healthy, your tree will receive all the nutrients that it ever needs. So I like to think of soil as sort of this, you know, it's like having chickens. You, know, you gotta feed your chickens. Soil's the same way. You don't spray your chickens with chemicals. I think um, soil's exactly the same. If you get at the rotting stuff it needs and you don't kill off the life that's in there, it's gonna take care of your plants. And not only that, but it's gonna have all this amazing other benefits to it. So I wanna stop, well, I'm gonna show you this big picture here. I think, you know, if we're talking trees, cause we do need to bring it back to trees, of course, uh, you can't have healthy trees without healthy soil. And I think if we're talking about reforesting places and bringing trees back in mass and planting in urban spaces, then we really have to be talking about soil also. And we have to, we have to talk about how the soil is managed. You know, should we be spraying fertilizers each year? Should we be spraying herbicides each year? Is that undermining the health of our tree? And then, you know, there's so many other things that come with this. I wanna stop right here, because it's a good place to stop. Uh, we're gonna go to pruning next, and I wanna take some questions. Um, Chris, are you willing to read them off again? Of course, be happy to. And there, there has been some, which is great. In fact, a pretty good number of them. Martha was wondering about lumber companies. She's wondering how they're doing uh, in the replanting and helping the environment as they cut down their existing uh, stocks of, of trees for lumber purposes. Um, man. Or outside of your studies. It's just no ecosystem benefit. It's a, it's a crop. And like many other industrial crops, it's being done all the wrong ways. So I, I just, I don't agree with how it's being done and the ecosystem issues. If you want to read more about this, there's some really good books out there. Overstory just won a Pulitzer Prize earlier in the year. It's just a fascinating book. It talks a lot about this. Good. And you inspired some people with your wood chips, as you can probably imagine. Uh, Joyce was wondering, uh, how do you get an arborist uh, to provide you with wood chips for free? And then Rich commented about chipdrop.com. Yep. And you don't, don't let any tree service ever charge you for wood chips because if they don't drop them off at your house for free, they have to pay to take them somewhere. So you should be able to get free chips from any tree service and tell them you don't want them to leave their chunks of wood in there. Yep. 
And um, uh, uh, Jane was wondering, why do triple shredded uh, um, mulch bark, whatever, uh, become hydrophobic, particles too small? I don't think you mentioned fungal mat, but I know that's what's happened in my yard with um, yeah. some things. Yeah. It's a fungal mat that develops on just the way this is processed. It's very uh, a grainy, woody material that just attracts a different kind of fungi. As a matter of fact, if you've ever struggled with artillery fungus, which is the stuff that shoots the little black spores on your siding that most people hate, that thrives in hydrophobic conditions. If you get rid of the hydrophobic mulch, you get rid of the artillery fungus. Yeah, I always, I always thought, <laughs> going to show my ignorance, I always thought that was little tar droplets from the road on my car, but it turns out it's from the mulch. <laughs> so you, you know, everyone now knows what I have in my yard, don't they? Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a fungal mat growing in the mulch. Right. Uh, Barbara asked, is there a concern with insect larvae or eggs, et cetera, and diseases when using uh, wood chips? No, definitely not. And do arborist wood chips have to age before you use them? Nope. I don't want to go too deep in the science here, but there's a little misnomer out there that it pulls nitrogen from your soil. And the, and the research shows that when you lay wood chips on top, it does not pull any nitrogen from your soil. The, the nitrogen process comes during decay. So for example, should you leave wood chips in the ground um, as they rot, part of the rotting process requires nitrogen inputs. So it pulls it from around. And then uh, when the rotting process is done, it releases nitrogen again. So that could, like if you had wood chips turned in the soil around a new tree, that could be bad for the new tree. But as long as it's on top, you don't have to worry about nitrogen being pulled out. And, and that's the big key. You said lay on top. Yep. This does not mean that you're incorporating those wood chips down into the ground. That's going to be a different story. Yep, that is very correct. Uh, and when you're using um, the pine bark fines that you use like in potting soils or for a soil amendment, those are aged. So that also took care of Penelope's uh, question that she had. And then Marilyn helped out with an answer. Uh, Melody asked, how can you apply these soil tips for clay soils? Principles still apply. So clay soils are usually just clay because of development. Um, you know, uh, you, the bulldozers come in, they scrape away the topsoil, and then they build houses. So a lot of times red clay is just due to development. Um, you can bring it back. The key is you've just got to feed the life that's in the soil. So, I mean, honestly, if you want to do the laziest version of soil rehabilitation possible, just throw wood chips in a spot and after 10 years of putting wood chips down, you will have healthy soil under those wood chips. I mean, not all the way down, but you'll have, you know, maybe an inch. Bryce even talks about that in his soil class and compares a, a garden that he's actively incorporated organic matter and a newer one where he's just put organic matter on the top. There's a difference, but it's amazing how far the organic matter has gone down into the soil that he has not tilled or done anything, done anything to. Uh, Joyce uh, wondered about magnolia tree leaves. Uh, she says they're so hard, and she said forgiving, but I think she might have meant unforgiving. I could be wrong, and she just said just the leaves. I like to mow my leaves and then use them as a mulch top dressing in my yard just because they're not as big and chunky and it looks a little bit more like regular mulch, so maybe that would help. You can do that, and you know, don't forget that you know, magnolia trees were doing just fine before we put them in our landscape, and they lived in their own leaves, so Trees need their own kinds of leaves because every different leaf and piece of the tree attracts different kinds of microbial life. So the magnolia leaf is attracting certain types of microbial life that very likely benefit that tree. And uh, Basil is not top, uh, talking about it today, but there are some trees that uh, create chemicals that keep weeds away. So that, that's also another little bonus. So that help you keep the weeds out from underneath your trees. Little side note, sorry about that. That's it for the questions for right now. Perfect, all right, well, let's keep going. We are on number nine, so, or eight, I guess. Um, with pruning, you know, if we're talking again, we want lots and lots of trees. That's the whole point of this uh, um, presentation. But if we're gonna have these trees in our urban spaces, well, then we, know, we need to know how to plant them and how to care for them, which is what we're talking about. Another big part of caring for a tree is understanding how to do pruning. So. You know, when pruning, always have a goal in mind. And we're gonna watch another video. I would argue that this is probably uh, tied with soil for the most important point tonight. Here in the forest,
trees compete for sunlight. And this means they grow tall, strong, and straight. But if left on their own, like this elm tree here, they often overgrow and end up hurting themselves in the long run. The answer is structural pruning. Hi, I'm Basil, and today we're talking about why we prune. It's the competition here in this forest that forces these trees to grow straight and tall. You'll notice they all have this general structure. They have a central straight trunk and well-balanced branches. This is really important for a tree. It's this ideal structure that helps keep them healthy and prevent breaking. Structure is strength. If we take away the forest, then all of a sudden this lone tree has all of the sunlight it could possibly want. And that means it's gonna grow every which away and it loses that really important structure that we saw in the forest. So I'll show you a couple of examples here on this elm tree. First of all, you'll notice that it has two trunks. And between these two trunks, it has this seam. This is something that could very easily separate in a windstorm, especially as the tree gets older. Then if we look up in the canopy, we see all these large overextended branches. It lacks the structure that we saw in the forest. And unfortunately for this tree, that means that it could split. If that happens, it could cause damage to property, it could hurt somebody. It would almost certainly be the end of this tree's life. The solution is structural pruning. And ideally that begins with a young tree like this oak. But it's important for older trees as well. The idea is that we remove branches to create the structure we're looking for. The process takes many, many years because we can only remove so many branches at any given time. But when it's done, hopefully we've created a tree that looks much like the ones we saw in the forest. That means a straight central trunk and well-spaced branches. For us to live side by side with trees in our neighborhoods means that structural pruning is really important. It helps keep trees healthy, prevents them from breaking, and it keeps us safe. And with all the serious issues that are facing our planet today, we need as many healthy trees as we can get. So once again, you know, we're just looking to see what happens normally. And, and if you walk through the woods, you're going to see this. So when you prune your trees or when you hire people to prune your trees, or if you're, you know, whatever it is, when you're managing trees, you need trees with strong, straight trunks and well-spaced smaller branches. And that's the safest tree. That might be a 300-year-old. That tree might give 300 years in the landscape versus one that doesn't have a good structure like we would see in the forest. Uh, maybe that tree splits at 80 years old and causes some damage. So, so it's a big thing to think about if we're gonna be planting a lot of trees. One other quick note on pruning, and then we're gonna do one more set of questions before we hit the final run. Um, let's talk about where to make those cuts. I see it all the time. I walk past a tree, I see pruning cuts, and I scratch my head, I'm like, my God, this person just spent $600 to get this beautiful oak tree pruned, but in fact, they spent $600 to kill the tree. Hello, I'm Basil. I'm a tricologist with Leaf and Limb, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about pruning. This is the bare minimum, because pruning is a very complex topic. There are whole books on the topic. There are whole training units on these topics, but I want to hit one really important thing. When you cut a branch, it has to be made in precisely the right manner at precisely the right location. You cannot just cut a branch anywhere. There's only one place on a branch where it has the ability to heal. We're gonna call it healing, even though a tree does something a little different, compartmentalizes. At the branch collar, which is a very distinct portion near the base of a branch or near where a lateral splits off of a branch, there are 
chemicals within the tree that allow it to properly compartmentalize this new wound. If you cut a branch anywhere else, it can't heal. It rots backwards into the trunk of the tree. And now you've got a tree that's rotting from the inside out. So these are just two quick notes on pruning. First, we, we showed the structural pruning. That's the goal that I would always recommend is structure. And then we talked about where to make these cuts because we don't want to have this beautiful pruning plan and then make the cuts in the wrong spot and then cause injuries that can never be undone. So the big picture here is uh, if we're going to have all these trees living with us, which we really need, then we've got to make sure that they live as long as possible, that they stay safe. You know, we've got to have safe trees. It's very important. And I think structural pruning is the best way to keep a tree strong. Let's pause for another round of questions and then we will go for the final tips. Uh, Chris, shall we? Yep. Um, I'm right here. Let me just get to the um, other spot. Okay. Uh, John was uh, wondering about soil that's short of lime. He's uh, apparently read that ProCal is sometimes recommended. Is, is that something that you've used, uh, Basil, or recommend? I don't think I've ever heard of it myself. I'm going to be um, stirring the pot a little bit with this next statement. So just, just know this is not 100% true, but I would recommend it's, it's not even worth getting in the rabbit hole of like these, these things with lime and all these inputs. You can, it's just not that complicated. I would just say get rotting stuff in your soil and whatever you're growing will, will have what it needs. Um, it's just that simple. I, don't, I would not recommend using lime. There's a lot of unintended consequences. I, a lot of reasons why I don't like lime. Okay. And I apologize in advance. I, I may ruin this name. I'm very sorry about it. But Calizarid has asked, what can be done for a fruit tree, specifically a cherry that grows very tall and thin, but has no branches? Interesting. Um, I would have to see this tree. Maybe send me an email. Uh, I'm having a hard time visualizing it. Um, but I don't know that anything needs to be done necessarily, unless there's a, an issue with the tree. Yeah, she, uh, they, didn't, they didn't mention specifically how tall it actually is, but it could just be going up like it normally does and then we'll grow yeah. branches. They just may yeah, not be yeah. low as they okay. trusted them. Yeah, it'd be helpful to know more about the age and these things, you're exactly right. I was envisioning like a 40 foot Dr. Seuss tree or something, but yeah. He's speaking up. I'll, I'll send you an email, thank you. Sure, okay. thank you. Um, Joyce has wondered if you have any comments about Dutch elm disease. Yeah, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, there's no real stopping it. Um, the best thing you can do is keep your tree healthy. Any tree that's healthy is going to have a, you know, trees have built-in defenses and they're very complex, incredible defenses. So a, an elm tree has the ability to withstand, um, it's still a tough thing to withstand, but the best success, the best chance of success will be a healthy element, which means you've got soil with lots of rotting stuff being added every year with wood chips, no chemicals, maybe just, that's it, you know, keep it healthy. That's your best defense. And I'm sure everyone here knows, but that's also why we ask everyone not to walk in the beds at the Arboretum because that compacts the soil, leads to some problems, our um, uh, weeping, Winged elm, unfortunately, did succumb to Dutch elm disease quite a while ago, and sadly, that was a favorite tree for uh, people to walk into beds and, and have their photographs taken. I'm not directly blaming it. That plant is tall or not tolerant, but is resistant to Dutch elm, but it can get it, and it did succumb. Um, Just a little bit on this. You know, what we don't necessarily, there's some really fascinating books about what bugs actually see. And they see an infrared and in color shades that we can't see. And they see also in these chemical trails. Um, the antenna on, on the front of moths are just incredible for following chemical trails. Um, and so when we look at a tree, we just see trees. But when a bug looks at a tree, it can just see from the infrared color whether it's healthy or not. And they attack unhealthy trees. So healthy tree is the strongest tree. Okay. The next one, I think they wanted um, answered anonymously in the chat, and I can't quite do it, so I'm going to bring it up because I don't remember the name of the book. The name of the book about trees in the southeast that was mentioned earlier? Overstory. Oh, not southeast. That was just trees in general, but it talked about uh, some lumbering logging. 
There we go. Oh, I just lost my place because I typed it. <laughs> yeah. uh, Story is a great book. There we go. Okay, Linda asked, is it ever necessary to do the crepe myrtle murder? Mine are so bad looking, I'm thinking of uh, they do better. <laughs> um, the answer is it's not a great idea because it doesn't really achieve any goals and it puts your tree at risk. The only goal it achieves is reducing the size of the plant. And really when it comes to trees, you can't really do that. It doesn't work like that. Uh, now go for it if you're willing to lose the plant because you might, um, there's no, you know, no, whatever. But what I would recommend potentially thinking about is if you're having to do all this maintenance on the tree, it might be the wrong tree for that spot. And let's not forget, crepe myrtles are from China. They really don't feed anything here. So my recommendation is get rid of the crepe myrtle, plant a small native species that'll do well in that space that you don't have to maintain. And now it's a double win. No maintenance for you and lots of uh, food for local ecology. They feed Japanese beetles. Which are also from China. <laughs> 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 that, that's just trying to prove you wrong. I was just having fun with you. Uh, yes. George commented that he's lost a lot of red oaks in the fo in forests near him uh, due to root rot. Wondering if there are any solutions for that. I don't offhand. We've done some pretty interesting work in situations like that. There are often reasons, but they're really big reasons. Uh, sometimes it's to do with pollution runoff from rivers. Sometimes it's to do with groundwater issues. Uh, they're usually pretty hard to find. So there could be an issue, but I will also say there might not be an issue. We can't forget that fungi are also part of the ecosystem. They play a role. So sometimes when, if you're in the woods and fungi are killing trees, that's just how it goes. You know, that they're opening up meadows so we can get re-nitrification and this whole cycle starts over. So nature's constantly in cycles. It might just be part of what should be happening or it could be an issue. It's hard to say. Okay, and the next one, I don't see a question in, but I'm just gonna bring it up anyway. Joyce says that she has uh, a river birch, which is always losing branches and weeps with long branches that need, she needs to cut, but she doesn't wanna cut the whole branch at the cuff. And I just wanna add, that just seems like what river birches do. So if that's not something that you like, maybe a different tree is in order. I, I did remove the ones out of my yard for that very reason. Yeah, and I, and I think you asked if you could make a cut at a different place. And the answer is yeah, when there's, uh, they're called laterals. Like a, when a side branch comes off the main branch, you can make a cut back to that point. And just, you know, we have a bunch of videos on YouTube uh, and there's a lot of good stuff out there, but yeah, you can make cuts in other places, but there are specific places. And real quick, going back to the oak thing, if you want to shoot me an email, I'm happy to try to help analyze that with you. And Laura, she, she brings up a good one. She says that she was uh, taught a while ago to use paint on a cut, but now she's been told not to. Correct. That's an old practice. Uh, there's no basis for it working. And in some cases, it actually causes more harm. Exactly. Oh, Marilyn has a long one. Thanks, Marilyn. A large pine fell in a storm and ripped off the top half of a central truck of a red maple. Is there any saving it or is it better to cut it down and get it replaced? It's not ever going to be able to heal that wound, is it? Will it just rot downwards? Probably won't heal the wounds, but you know, it's kind of like chess. If you don't have, if you're not under threat, don't make a move. Um, I would leave it until it becomes hazardous or if it's in a place that it doesn't matter if it falls, leave it because uh, a dead tree is a whole new ecosystem. That's, that's home for woodpeckers. If you get woodpeckers to roost, now you have free pest control. Uh, beetles, if you get beetles to hang out, now they're your, mo your top ground predator. Bats, which eat mosquitoes. Um, so you can have like a whole bunch of services on call here in that hollow tree to you know, keep your garden pest free and keep your yard mosquito free. And Ra Rachel has a good one. And I'm, I'm actually of the opposite opinion of possibly her. She's asking about roots growing on the top of soil from rar large trees, wondering if they should be cut or leave them alone. Um, I happen to like the look of them. I, those tropical trees with the, the big roots that just go all over the place, those are stunning. I, I wish my trees in my forest would do that, but mine are all below the ground. Or, or she asked if with the soil. We see this a lot. Now, obviously tropical, like ficus is different, but 
barring ficus, local trees, we see this a lot in new development. And the issue is again, uh, the, the, the clay, the roots cannot go down because roots are after air and water and food, like everything else on planet earth. And there's none of those things in the red clay. So the answer, you know, if you could be there when the tree was planted, you would want to improve the soil around it. It's probably too late if you've already got large roots. So what I recommend is just put a thick bed of wood chips around it. Don't even try to grow grass. The wood chips are going to protect the roots from the lawnmower. They're going to make your yard look nicer and they're going to rot over time and give better soil conditions. So I think the win here is the wood chips. That kind of goes to the next question that Robin asked. She's wondering if wood chips are good for all gardens in the place of mulch or just around trees. All gar um, well, okay, if we're talking about gardening, you know, vegetables are a little different than trees. Uh, they do prefer bacterially dominant soil um, versus a fungally dominant soil for trees. So I would say for gardens, and I'm not much of a master gardener, there's people in here who could give a lot better answer to this, but I think you want more of your nitrogen greens like grass and certain types of compost. Wood chips can definitely help with weed suppression, um, but if you're trying to use them to feed your plants, they might not do exactly what you want. I'm a little, all, yeah, a little out of my element here, but I don't think they're gonna cause any harm. We'll, we'll put a little asterisk on it, that maybe not vegetable gardens then. Um, and rock. Vegetables, the one category I don't do. In addition to being a tree professional, my hobbies involve growing wildflowers and shrubs, and they work great for all of that. Uh, Ron had a comment followed by a question. He commented that most of your fruit trees are exotic except for pawpaws and wondered if they have a place for a sustainable tree environment. You know, uh, yes, Helen Yost, I think, has maybe 35 native fruit trees in her yard. Uh, and there's a lot of native fruit trees that I was not aware of. Um, and let's not forget like blueberries, uh, not technically a tree, but they can get pretty big. So there's more native fruit trees than you might think. But you will go hungry if you only stick to natives. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. So the question was, yes, maybe I misunderstood the question. Yeah, and uh, let's see. Uh, Edward asked, is there an exceptional book on pruning trees? Yes, anything by Ed Gilman is amazing. He's very technical, but he's the best. Um, he's from University of Florida. He's retired now, but he's written a couple of books that are just phenomenal for trees. If you want to prune shrubs, I'd say Cass Turnbull, the best book out there. It's called uh, Pruning Third Edition. It's a great book. She's amazing, by the way. Unfortunately, she died two years ago, but she's got a really cool organization called Plant Amnesty out of uh, Portland, I think it is. And I, I was just smiling because I think the question coming in faster than, than I'm getting to them. Um, Penelope asked or commented that she has a mature pine tree on her property line and uh, her neighbor parks on, on top of its roots. She's concerned about the health of the tree will eventually be a danger to her house. And should she remove the tree or just monitor it? Oh, definitely don't remove it. I think that's an easy fix. Like maybe if your neighbor is not interested in maybe putting some wood chips and parking on wood chips, which kind of, which helps disperse the weight, then take care of the soil on your half and the tree will begin moving more of its rooting into your side and it should be fine. So the next question is about redwood trees. Marianne was asking if that's going to be a good tree to plant in North Carolina. You've commented that you enjoy natives, but Redwoods are native to the United States, just not this side of the country, at least not at this current time frame. Sure, go for it. Uh, Dawn Redwood will do just fine here. Well, I was I was thinking coastal redwood. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, I know there's a couple of redwoods growing around here, but I, I, they're not going to do great. Your Dawn Redwood will do really well, and they look kind of like the southern bald cypress. They're really cool trees. Yeah, the the Dawn Redwoods grow very very well here, but the the coast redwood grows pretty good here too. I think it's the city of Wilson has a, a redwood tour that you can visit um, a lot of different areas to see some really cool mature redwoods. But there, there's actually a decent number just north of campus in downtown Raleigh. And Marilyn, <laughs> Marilyn just asked me for the names of the books again. Uh, I only remember Overstory. So Marilyn, I'm hoping someone else can type in some name of the books too. Uh, so I'm sorry about that one. Uh, and I'll get you all this stuff, but it's Ed Gilman for pruning trees. It's Cass Turnbull uh, for pruning shrubs, pruning third edition. Those are just some favorites.
but always feel free to shoot me an email. I'll happy to, I'm happy to reply. And please remember that while my memory might be short on the names of the books and the authors, we will have the video up and uh, you can pause and write down names and all kinds of things like that. So I reached the end, Basil, so it's yours again. Excellent, all right. Well, we are on number 10. So we're getting near the end here. Um, and now we're getting into insects. So this is a category that I think is really important. Um, it's a deep topic, I'm just gonna hit the surface, but if you're gonna treat for pests, we don't wanna use the shotgun approach. We have to be very careful in how we target our pests. We wanna hit them when they're most vulnerable with the least amount of um, chemicals, preferably none, and most pests can be fixed without the need of kept for chemicals um, because what we don't want to do is for example spray a whole shrub and kill everything on the shrub not only is that really bad for the local ecology but what ends up happening is your problematic pests tend to come back first and then they come back with a vengeance because there's no predatory insects to keep them in place so i want to show you um, just two things here here's an example this is from a proposal from a, a company here locally. Um, and if you ever see, if you ever decide to hire a service or this is your lawn care, it doesn't really matter who it is, but when you see things like, this treatment is a mixture of an insecticide, miticide, and fungicide, please don't, don't waste your money. Uh, forgetting any of the damage that this causes, just don't waste your money. This does not work. That it, nature is not so simple that you can just hit it with some fog and boom, your problems are solved. It's way more complicated than that. Um, let's look at a little video here. When treating for pests, you've got to be very specific in how you do so. The goal is to disrupt the life cycle of that specific organism without causing any unintended harm to other members of the ecosystem. Otherwise, you might end with a problem much bigger than the one you started with. Another very effective way to treat pests is to identify the underlying health issue and fix that. Because if you can do that, you'll create a healthy tree that's able to naturally defend itself from these pests by keeping a balanced ecosystem. This goes back to the question we were talking about earlier with the elm tree. This is the real key here. You shouldn't even need to treat your trees. If you need to treat your trees, you should be asking, why am I having to treat my trees? Um, there's probably a stressor or maybe the tree's in the wrong spot. There's usually a reason for this. But let's say you do need to treat. Well, there's all kinds of things you can do that don't even involve chemicals. One of the things we do here at Leaf and Limb, we've really gone on the rabbit hole on this, but we actually use insects to get rid of the other insects we're after. Uh, these are called predatory insects. There's all kinds of really amazing things you can do. Over the last three or four years, we've been able to get rid of every single chemical we used uh, through research and finding alternatives. There's at this point only one chemical class that so far, there's not an alternative for, and it's uh, treating for borers. But even there, a lot of really cool research coming out about how to use fungi to do that. So I think we're on the cusp of getting that one. Um, all this to say, chemicals are just not the answer. They have this really big unintended consequence for bees. And if you've been following anything to do with bees, um, you know we're in trouble. 50% uh, of the bee population in North Carolina is gone. Nationwide, it's 50%. Canada's lost 70% of their bees. This is really, really critical because our food is pollinated via bees. Um, United Nations says that if we lose bees, we lose a third of the world's food supply within two weeks. It's really critical stuff. And that's just the bees. We only care about bees. They make the headlines because they produce food, so they have value to us. But there are tens of thousands of other insect populations suffering that we haven't really studied because they don't currently have an economic value for us. Um, all right, number 11, we're getting there. Some pest damage is normal. Let the bugs eat. It doesn't, you know, if there's a little bit of leaf uh, damage or something, it's, it's not a big deal. Um, but pests are bugs too. They've got to eat. This is a thing we call threshold. So, so long as the plant is still overall a healthy plant, let the pests eat. They're just bugs. So this is the big picture here. Um, we've lost a lot of insects, something like 60% of all insects are gone. For those of you who drive to the beach regularly and have done so for the last 20 or 30 years, 
you've probably noticed you just don't have as many bugs on your windshield as you used to 20 years ago. And that's not just you. That's because there are just less bugs now. And bugs play this particularly caterpillars, that really fundamental role in our ecosystems. They're the bridge between energy that's locked in leaf, but the sun's energy in a leaf and a protein-based diet. They are the bridge. And most of the world's humans and other species need protein. So they, they have huge, huge role in our ecosystems and our food chains, and they play a role with trees and their ecosystems. So we need insects for trees, for humans, and just for the general health of our planet. I'm gonna do number, uh, actually I'm gonna pause for, no, I'm gonna to go to the end because we're right just two minutes away. And then we can do one final round of questions. Number 12, and hopefully you've sort of picked up on this through the presentation. When you're in doubt, look at the trees in the forest. What is nature doing? Whatever nature's doing is probably working pretty well. We know that nature is tried and true for millennia. These are good systems we can just simply tap into. We don't have to outscience nature. We don't have to build giant factories and crazy ideas. All we have to do is just turn and look in the woods. Everything we need is there. So we can make a difference. We need to plant trees, help them thrive, help them reach maturity, and we need to care for the trees that we have. We also need to spread the word. We've got to just tell other people these basic things that are so important. And it's on us to continue learning. I would suggest if you're interested, um, we have a bunch of resources. Uh, we've got on our website, uh, leaflim.com, we've got tons of articles about so many things we talked about today and other things. Um, we've got this online course here on how to become a trichologist. You can you can start our online course. It's just some fun emails and videos, a lot of which you've seen today, but more detail. Get your friends to join uh, or get our ebook. We have the short ebook you can download called Top 12 Tips for Healthy, Happy Trees. This is all a big part of, oh, and then finally, of course, is the YouTube channel. You've been watching all these videos. We've got a bunch of other videos on here. And this is a great way for you to learn more, spread the word to other people, and, you know, Maybe we can make a difference. I'm very optimistic. I really do think we can. So thank you for your time. And I'm going to hang out and answer as many questions as you'd like. And Chris, if you're there, then you okay. It takes me a little while to find the buttons because I cover it up with the uh, participant window. And I uh, just have to find my mouse and, and get back. People have been very kind in the comments and been adding in some of the book titles and the authors and, and the prices. So they've been busy and there hasn't been any new questions since then. So maybe if there's more questions they can ask, but they might be all asked out by now. Okay. Because you've certainly given them a lot of, a lot of, a lot of opportunities. Yeah, I'll hang out here. Uh, and uh, please, y'all, send me feedback. I really would love your feedback on what was good, what was not good, what I should change. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear from you. My email, I'll throw it in the chat again here, but it's um, basil.commute at leaflimb.com. I'm tapping, typing in now. Thank you again. And don't forget, y'all, JC Ralston is amazing. Make sure you're supporting them. This is a tough time to be a nonprofit during COVID. Uh, send money to JC Ralston. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Marilyn just wondered if you can go back to the previous screen with the URL, or maybe you can just type it if you remember what, what the URL was. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Why don't I just type it in the chat? That'd, that'd be good. That's the tree, that's the courses that we've got, just some little fun stuff. And then this is the uh, articles, All kinds of fun stuff here. And Linda was wondering about wax myrtle. She has a bunch behind her house. She's been told to keep away mosquitoes, but her neighbors hate them. They're a great species. They get a bad rap because they were overused, but they, they provide a lot of important food, a lot of deterrent power. I, I'm, I don't love how they look, but I sure do love what they do. And I actually really love how they smell. I, I think they're a good wildlife plant. I think birds yeah. really enjoy the berries and, and birds will definitely reduce the population of, of insects. Absolutely. That right there would be good. So I see lots of kudos. Awesome. Well-deserved. 
is there a way that you can send me this whole thing for, so I can review it later? Or is that, is that a feature? For what, the chat? Yeah. yeah you can, any, anyone can save the chat with the three little dots in the lower right side of the chat window, and they can just do uh, save chat. Okay, I'll save the chat then. And that way, if anyone privately sent you a message, Basil, you can uh, save it directly yourselves. And uh, Robin commented that one of your folks is coming out to her house tomorrow. Awesome. Let me know how that goes. <laughs> if it doesn't go well, you let me know. Just looking at some more questions. And Laura asked, are there more videos available? I think you've already answered that one. You have oodles of them, don't you? YouTube, tons of stuff there. We've got a bunch. And I, I, Every month we do a newsletter, y'all. Uh, we're doing wood chips, actually, in two weeks. And we do a little bit of a deep dive into wood chips. So uh, you can sign up for our newsletter all on our website. I did tell everyone to send you an email earlier to, to get signed up for the newsletter. Excellent. Oh, well, here's, and, this might be a question. Oh, yep, sent to me privately, so I'll just leave that anonymous. Is there anything that can be done for ash trees infected with emerald ash borers? Um, yes. Um, the only thing, okay, it depends on how far gone it is, but the only really effective product I would recommend right now is a trunk injection of a product called Triage. The active ingredient is a mesotene benzoate. Uh, it's really the only thing that I would consider. I know a lot of folks will recommend uh, drenching the tree with a midacloprid, but that is a heavy duty neonicotinoid. I'm, I'm not comfortable recommending that. It kills bees and all kinds of stuff. So I, I think the trunk injection with a product called Triage is the way to go. You can't do it yourself, not easily. Uh, I don't want to plug leaf in them per se. We can help you, but anybody who's worth their salt should be able to help you with that. Donald commented that your folks came out to their house. Folks, not meaning your parents, but your, your <laughs> co-workers came out to their house last year and did a great job. And Barbara, a uh, list of trees is Doug Tallamy. Uh, the book um, is his, it's his only book written for landscape designers. It's the full size book. I can't remember the name of it, which is crazy. Um, but just look up, okay, he's got a whole website. I forgot about this. Look up Doug Tallamy, T-A-L-L-M-Y or E-Y and a uh, native plant finder. And he did this whole website where you can like put in your zip code and it'll show you uh, the native species for your area. It's really cool. And he's an amazing author, by the way. His books are so good. And that was the end of the comments and questions. Cool. Uh, you know, uh, in parting, Chris, I'll just say, if y'all have any feedback for me, let me know. Um, we can do it later. Um, or whenever, but if you have anything especially critical or constructive, I'd like to hear how to make it better. Oh, I thought it was outstanding. So thank okay. you so much, uh, Basil, for joining us tonight, and thank you to everyone else as well. I hope we'll see you at some of the future upcoming programs as well. And of course, Basil's given you his uh, email address on several, several occasions, so you know what to do with it if you have more questions. All right, thank you. Okay. See you Thanks, everyone.